welcome everybody and apology a little bit of apology is new very new to the hop in system but delighted that you're here and excited to get going um i'm joanne bauer i'm the co-founder of rights collab we are a collaborative collaboration of, of collaborative specialist in the fields of civil society finance business and technology and we are working together uh, to incubate new approaches to human rights challenges that draw from and bridge these fields. Now, the, the question of how we tackle growing inequality is inherent in the Democratizing Work Manifesto. So is shifting the power so that workers and those who have been sidelined by the current economic system have greater control over their own lives and the sustainable care and enjoyment of the precious natural resources that belong to all of us. During the lockdown days of the pandemic, Isabel Ferreira and her academic colleagues came together to express so eloquently and forcefully through the manifesto what we were all seeing and experiencing, the full-on commodification of workers, so-called essential workers, who toiled in conditions that no thinking and feeling person could declare was right. At the time that they were coming and disseminating the manifestos, others of us were considering how to address the need to hold corporations and investors to account for systematically shortchanging workers and other stakeholders. As business strategist and Forbes columnist Steve Deming wrote in January 2020, just before the pandemic, uh if the if big business systematically short changes stakeholders other than than shareholders the stock market may store in the short term but the decades-long diversion of business income to shareholders results results um stagnating incomes for most of the population inequality consequently increases with risks that populist leaders will emerge and the political consensus holding capitalism in place will unravel. Now, there may be some of us here in this room who don't think that the unraveling of capitalism is all that um, bad of an idea, but not certainly not in that way. There are people, there are essential workers whose human rights must be upheld. As we watched the events of 2020 unfold, we considered a way to meet the market need to measure and manage the impacts that companies and investors have on inequality and thereby hold them accountable for changing their practices. We can draw on their own self-interest to manage the systemic risk of inequality that threatens the whole economy. That way that we came up that we were thinking about is a task force on inequality related financial disclosures or what we call Tifty. It was an idea that some of us had floated before, but now at that moment seemed exactly the right time to get started. Tifty could improve transparency on corporate and investor contributions to inequality, and at the same time illuminate how inequality can present risks to companies and investors. With a grant from the Tipping Point Fund for Impact Investing, this summer, Rights Collab, together with the Argentinian Network for International Corporation, or RASI, the Pre-Distribution Initiative, and the Southern Center for Inequality Studies have now begun the task of incubating TIFD, which involves building a broad coalition of civil society, business, investors, and others to co-create it. It's our conviction that getting co-creation right is fundamental to the success of TIFD to meet the objective of reducing inequality through the very market that has recreated it requires that TIFTI be different from other disclosure frameworks for managing social and environmental risks. It demands that the legitimate representatives of the most vulnerable participate in the, its development and do so on equal footing from the start. After all, who should define what inequality is? Who should have in voice in what the targets, metrics, and thresholds should be? What experience can the Global South bring to bear on how we understand what is needed? Without the active input of those most infected by inequality, we are bound to fail. 
We're here today and very grateful to the organizers for making it so to consider together what is possible to achieve through TIFTI and how we manifest a democratic process and governance structure in TIFTI to force the markets to reduce systemic risk and right the wrongs to make the market fairer for all. This forum comes at just the right moment for TIFTI. There's a direct parallel between just governance at the corporate level and for TIFTI. This panel will intentionally engage the democratize, decommodify, and decarbonize themes by focusing on inclusive democratic processes for mitigating inequality and bringing attention to the multiple intersecting ways in which inequality manifests and is perpetuated in the market. I'm very, very pleased about who's joining us today. We have recently constituted an interim secretariat to incubate TIFTI consisting of the four organizations that I just mentioned. As with any new project, we've spent many weeks in, on Zoom calls, hammering out the mechanics of collaboration and coordination to get our effort to the point of takeoff. And it's a delight that this forum um, really provides the first opportunity for each of our organizations to delve into the issues that sit at the core of this endeavor. In addition to the representatives from each of our organizations, Delilah Rothenberg, um, Imran Valodia, and Guillermo Correa, we're thrilled to be joined by two most brilliant colleagues in the field, Aaron Sahan and Jillian Marcel, whom we hope, along with those of you attending, will continue to be involved as we forge ahead. We cannot do this alone. Um, with this panel, we're inviting an open debate on key aspects of TISTI, its concept, efficacy, process, and substantive orientation. And we hope that you will actively engage with us through the chat and as well as during the discussion time. And now let me turn it over to the panel. We will start with Delilah Rothenberg, co-founder and executive director of the Pre-Distribution Initiative. PDI is a multi-stakeholder effort to improve investment structures, to share more wealth and influence with workers and communities, have stronger incentives to invest responsibly, and that ultimately address systemic risks, including inequality, biodiversity loss, and climate change. Delilah brings over 16 years of experience in finance with 12 years focused on ESG and impact investing in the private capital markets. We start with Delilah to explain TIFTI and from an investor perspective with all those years as a practitioner to help us to understand what good what what is what what good a disclosure framework like Tifty can do? So I pass it over to Delilah. Thanks, Joanne, and it's a pleasure to be here with all of you today. Thanks so much for your interest in um, Tifty and to our fellow panelists. I'm excited to hear what everybody has to say. I'm gonna just set up a share screen. Um, because I prepared some slides to explain what Tifty is. And, um, you know, uh, let's see, can everybody see my screen? I can't see you anymore, so I yeah. can't. Okay, great. Lila looks great. Okay, wonderful. Um, so we're really pleased to be part of the interim secretariat, as Joanne mentioned, um, at the pre-distribution initiative. And uh, as Joanne also mentioned, TIFTI is really designed to be a risk management framework to reduce inequality caused by the private sector. And we do this through creating um, uh, guidance and thresholds and targets and metrics for um, investors and companies to measure and manage their impacts on inequality and also measure and manage how inequality impacts them. So I'll walk through some of the history behind TIFTI and the theory of change uh, in this brief presentation. TIFTI is really made possible at this moment in time because of emerging new economic and financial thinking. So um, this shift is really just starting to happen. We realize that this is not representative of the majority of the market right now, but there is momentum with investors really shifting from prioritizing the profits of individual companies at any cost, ignoring externalities, 
to focusing on the health of the global economy and human and natural systems. And this is happening for a variety of reasons because of changing market structure, as well as um, growing awareness of the risks of climate change in particular, but also emerging issues like inequality and biodiversity loss. Um, a lot of investors, uh, particularly, particularly the largest investors in the market, like pension funds who manage the um, retirement accounts of millions of pensioners globally, um, they are very diversified across uh, in, in their investments across geographies and across industries and what we call asset classes or different types of investments. And so they're very exposed to the health of the overall economy and therefore, um, you know, the health of overall markets. And they're long term investors. So risks that manifest in the real economy that eventually translate into risks in the financial markets um, are, uh, are threats to them and their financial performance. And so that's why these investors are really starting to wake up to the fact that they need to get more information about what activities caused by the private sector are causing things like climate change and inequality and um, and what they can do to control for that and reduce uh, uh, those, those activities. So, oh, wrong way. So we have currently, um, a measurement and management system in the financial markets that's based on the old regime. So policymakers and regulators really set the official rules of the game. Um, and that information is very limited right now because it's based on this old way of, um, of you know, managing markets and investments where you prioritize the financial performance of individual companies. Um, ignoring externalities. And you know, there have been moments in uh, in the past where policymakers and regulators who oversee financial markets have inserted, you know, a few provisions for reporting on certain environmental reporting on certain environmental and social issues for companies, but they're not really systemic in nature. They're sort of one off um, based on uh, based on stakeholder interest. So investors use the um, disclosure requirements that are set by policymakers and regulators to get information from their asset managers and companies. And I'll explain asset managers for those of you who aren't familiar with that concept in a second and how that's different from, from other investors. But, um, you know, one other thing that investors have started to do over the past decade or so is ask for additional information aside from what's mandated um, uh, by policymakers and regulators as for additional environmental and social information. But again, that's really about the risks to individual company performance. So, you know, if a company has a, a health and safety issue, how is that going to impact the company's performance? It's not really about the externalities that the company is causing. Like if they're not paying a living wage, what is that doing to exacerbate inequality and how can that impact the economy? So, um, what ends up happening with this old regime of disclosure is that you have investors um, asking asset managers and their, the companies that they invest in um, to report on uh, these relatively short-term and myopic metrics. Uh, and in the case of inequality, that can exacerbate inequality. Asset managers and companies uh, then have certain incentives based on the information that investors are asking. Because what do investors do with the information? They say, oh, well, we, we're not going to invest in your company or through your asset manager anymore um, if you're not doing X, Y, and Z because we don't like the information that you gave us. Um, or they might say, you know, we're going to remove directors from your board at, you know, your company if you're not performing along the lines of what we're looking for. So that really, the information that gets disclosed to investors really um, you know, helps set the incentives for asset managers and companies. So if you're not familiar with the concept of asset managers, they are a type of investor, but they're a little bit different. Um, when we refer to investors in this slide, uh, in this conversation, we're thinking about the asset owners. So the pensioners um, and their pension funds, or, you know, a high net worth individual, um, or family office, or an endowment, or a sovereign wealth fund. And they sometimes invest directly into companies, but they sometimes also invest into companies through asset managers. So the asset manager um, has a chunk of the of the capital that investors want to invest, and they charge a fee for managing that, and then they invest in the companies. But the investors, of course, um, choose their asset managers based on you know various uh, various factors. So it's important that the asset managers. Um, who can contribute to inequality in their own structures. So for instance, how high is asset manager compensation? 
or our asset managers domiciling their funds in tax havens or um, engaging in lobbying and political spend that can exacerbate inequality. So um, investors can use information to influence asset managers and companies and both asset managers and companies have impacts on inequality. So if you're not managing the right information uh, to, to control for externalities, then inequality grows at the bottom of the slide and that can impact the economy. There's lots of emerging data about how inequality can um, cause a, a poor economic performance and how that eventually translates into uh, uh, instability in financial markets for investors. And that's particularly problematic for long-term investors who are some of the largest and most influential in the market um, and are really beginning to take this new approach um, that I described on the previous slide of measuring and managing for externalities. Um, and it might be worth just mentioning that these sort of new kinds of investors are sometimes dubbed universal owners because they own, uh, you know, every industry, every geography, every asset class, they're long-term investors. So we could use that for short to refer to those kinds of investors who are, who are measuring and managing for externalities. So with all this said, we clearly need improved disclosure frameworks. So we need to account for feedback loops first and foremost. Um, so not only measure uh, the inside out risks, so how are, um, well, I should actually say, not only measure the outside in risks first, so not only uh, how is inequality impacting companies and investors' financials, but also the inside out risks. So how are companies um, and investors contributing to inequality? We also should look at the full value chain. A lot of existing disclosure is just focused on company um, operations. So the portfolio companies that investor is investing into. But as I mentioned on the previous slide, asset managers can contribute to inequality in their own structures. And even the investors themselves can contribute to inequality, for instance, and in how returns are distributed. Um, so it's really important that we capture the full value chain, the full capital markets value chain, as we say at the pre-distribution initiative in terms of what's happening with each actor and how they might be contributing to, um, to inequality. Uh, currently, you know, with existing um, disclosure frameworks focused on environmental and social issues in capital markets, uh, companies are starting to set goals and targets around environmental and social issues and investors are as well, but lots of times that those goals and targets can be arbitrary. Um, so you might set a, a goal um, to increase wages by a certain amount over time, but are you really raising wages in a way that um, allows people to have a good living wage or build wealth? Are you um, are you uh, focusing on pay equity or are you just setting goals and targets relative to you know, your peers performance, peer companies performance or historical performance that you might've had or you know, what is convenient for you? So the targets and goals really need to be context-based as we say um, and informed by planetary boundaries and uh, human rights. And that's something that we would like to focus on at TIFTI. And as Joanne um, emphasized, and this is so important, um, we can't develop this kind of framework focused on inequality if it's not rights-based and inclusive. So we need to center rights holders, particularly the um, marginalized and vulnerable, in a co-creation process that really breaks through historical power imbalances. Um, and we want this to be collaborative and constructive. So Tifti's theory of change right here, um, we, uh, we want to have improved disclosure and targets so that policymakers and regulators can have improved information to um, uh, offer improved incentives and have better accountability frameworks. Workers and communities will have that information to hold investors, um, asset managers and companies accountable. Um, investors will have improved information to hold their asset managers and companies accountable and set better incentives for them on how to perform. Um, and then, uh, you know, conceivably the economy will do better because you have less inequality um, markets will do better. So workers and communities and investors will all uh, do better in their own, um, in their own ways of, of measuring better. So um, as Joanne mentioned, we started, we raised uh, the idea of TIFTI in May 2020 in an article in um, a responsible investment publication. 
And then there was interest by a number of different stakeholders who read the article. So we engaged in a year long process of stakeholder engagement. We developed a frequently asked questions document uh, to document what, um, what folks were interested in and, um, and what their questions were and how TIFD would address these different um, questions and concerns. And that is iterative and ongoing. And most recently, we formed an interim secretariat um, with Rossi uh, Rights Collab, the Southern Center for Inequality Studies, and ourselves. I'm really pleased to be here with representatives of all of us today. Uh, and as Joanne said, secured uh, seed funding from the Tipping Point Fund on impact investing, which we're very grateful for. In terms of next steps, um, as I mentioned, we will do iterative stakeholder mapping engagement, coalition building and research throughout the life of TIFT, um, as well as fine tuning of the FAQ and different communications materials and incorporating feedback. Um, and, and, and I hesitate to even call it feedback because this is really a co-creation process. So it's, it's gonna be dynamic, it'll constantly evolve um, based on new stakeholder groups that, that get involved and um, changing dynamics and new information learned. Um, this year, from the second half of 2021 to the first half of 2022, we're really focusing on the, developing the governance structure. Uh, we want it to be inclusive. Um, we want it to be uh, democratic. Um, and we want it to be very diverse. And so uh, it's going to require a lot of um, a lot of time and attention. We want to do it right. And that's why we're dedicating the first year to getting that structure right. And, and really interested in everybody's uh, thoughts and feedback on that. Um, we expect that we'll be ready to start actually working on the disclosures in 2023, which includes mapping existing disclosures, uh, identifying gaps in those disclosures, and then recommendations for synthesis and, dis and, and closure of those gaps, and then um, sort of launch a, a test framework in 2024 with guidance and um, have it be piloted by companies and investors in 2025. And along the way, build support with policymakers and regulators to really give this some teeth and make it official um, and, uh, and deepen accountability. Uh, in terms of the various roles and activities, we're very interested in you getting involved if, if, you, um, if you'd like. Um, we would love, love you to. We expect to develop thematic working groups on different kinds of topics. Some of these working groups are cross-cutting. They're not set in stone. They're preliminary ideas about what some working groups could be. And they're obviously not comprehensive because they're just what could fit on this slide easily to give you a preliminary idea. Um, uh, but you know, there are themes like um, different forms of discrimination that exist in terms of race, ethnicity, case, um, gender, global south, global north. Um, ability, sexual orientation. Um, there's different uh, aspects to human rights, like water, health, housing, food, and education. Um, there are metrics that will apply to corporates. There are metrics that will apply to investors. There are metrics that will be focused on workers, metrics focused on communities and customers, um, climate and nature, what's the nexus with climate and the just transition, um, climate justice and um, also political activity, tax, um, stakeholder engagement, and governance. We expect to have regional hubs. Uh, obviously, inequality differs globally, and um, there are also different um, jurisdictional, uh, uh, legal and regulatory aspects to consider. Um, we'll have a technical working group to work on technical aspects of getting this together. The interim secretariat, which will eventually become an official secretariat with members elected by the coalition, and a global advisory council, um, which we, which is not formed yet. So um, with that, I'm sure I'm probably at my eight minutes or over. So thanks so much. And uh, you can learn more at thetifty.org. Thanks so much, Delilah. And, and I would say that for those of you who um, have questions about this to, to please put your questions in the q and I'm sure you do. We're going to now sort of delve into some of the more conceptual issues um, uh, that underpin this idea. Um, and, uh, and then in the Q&A, we can come back and maybe ask Delilah to sort of clarify something, question anything you may have. I want to now move on to, um, to Aaron Sahan and, and really, really thankful for the, that you could be here. Um, Aaron leads the business and enterprise work at Donut Economics Action Lab. He, where his work focuses on enterprises designed to be regenerative and distri distributive. Ugh. 
Before joining Donut Economics Lab, he was the chief executive of the World Fair Trade Organization, a global network and verifier of social enterprises that practice fair trade. Arendt also spent seven years at Oxfam leading advocacy teams and founded Oxfam's Future of Business Initiative. Before all this, Arendt actually worked in business at Procter & Gamble as a market strategy manager, and even before that, establishing a furniture business. And he's also got the insight and from the aid and, and development worlds, having worked in Australia's aid program. Arendt lectures regularly on sustainable business and holds an honorary doctorate from Oxford Brookes University, and really eager to, to get your comments on all this, Arendt. So over to you. And thank you, Joanne. Wonderful to be here. And thank you, Delilah, for set setting this the scene so clearly and well. I, I think TIFID's an incredibly exciting and overdue initiative. So um, I'm going to take you through a little bit about why I think it's it's absolutely central right now to be asking some of the questions on inequality. I think the way that that TIFID is is positioning itself to ask. Um, I'll give a little bit more background about about what I'm currently doing and what. Uh, Donut economics is because it really is a new vision for what prosperity for humanity can look like, um, particularly this century with the new challenges of this century. And uh, a lot of my work currently is about shedding the isms of the 20th century. Uh, this is why I also won't be using some of the isms that are in the title of this session, because I, I think it's actually not necessarily helpful to bring the some of the 20th century baggage into, into the 21st century where we, we need new innovations in the way we structure ourselves our businesses, our economies, our investment flows, our trade. And, uh, and I think that's happening around the world in a very grassroots driven way. Um, well, I, I mean, our societies and our economies more generally, they need to occupy that space between our planet's boundaries and the social foundation. And that space of not overshooting on our planetary boundaries and not under delivering on what humanity needs to, to have dignified lives on this planet. Well, that ends up looking like a donut. And that's why it's called donut economics. Um, it's very much about envisioning a world that meets the needs of all people within the means of our living planet. Um, and, and those terms regenerative and distributive are really important because regenerative means we need to be quite generous back to the living world that actually supports our, uh, our economic activities, our societies and distributive because we, we need to address the vast inequalities that are currently in the world's economy and it means we probably need to start asking very difficult and complicated questions around the design of our enterprises do they need a complete refresh in the way we look at them from their purpose to their networks to their governance and ownership and finance of course some of you might be familiar with those headings because they're deeply inspired by the work of marjorie kelly on the traits of business ownership but I think that is particularly important here as we talk about inequality. So with that said, let me just say a few words on inequality as a challenge, because it's quite different to most of the other things that businesses and global leaders and civil society focus on generally, because on a planet with finite resources, how we distribute the benefits of economic value is absolutely paramount. We cannot endlessly grow production. We cannot endlessly grow consumption. Um, we, we might get to a point where we reduce our, some of the footprint of our economic activity on a one-to-one -one basis. But at the moment, we're nowhere near that. And we've got to figure out a way to stop exceeding the limits of our planet while delivering enough for the, for the humans that occupy this planet. And at the moment, we are failing miserably. Um, that question of distribution of value, distribution of opportunity, distribution of basic services, it's at the heart of the inequality question. So th this is why inequality is so important. However, inequality also, as, as we know from the work of Thomas Piketty and many other renowned economists, it forces us to ask really tough questions about the distribution of benefits, the distribution to labor versus capital. That is a part of the analysis that is a very inconvenient analysis that sits within um, any serious work on, on inequality and the economics behind it. Who gains from productivity gains is, is a big question. When we look at the last couple of decades, the real wage index has barely risen compared to the vast increases in labor productivity. So the increase in productivity uh, that we've seen workers drive around the world uh, over the last few decades has not meant an increase in real wages. Um, 
at the same time, we've seen a huge increase in dividends and share buybacks. These are all at historic levels. I mean, we'll find examples and markets where maybe it, it bucks the trend, but overall, that's the global picture. Returns to capital are, are growing far, far, far faster than returns to labor. And uh, that is the central pivotal point behind economic inequality, whether it's income inequality or wealth inequality. Now, mo models of business drive this. Models of business are designed in many instances to drive this. Um, they determine how value is distributed among stakeholders. They determine what and who gets priority in businesses. They determine who has power in those businesses. So, of course, here I'm saying let's think about some of the experiments that have been going on. Think about cooperatives and social enterprises, how they distribute value, how they distribute priorities. Think about multi-stakeholder ownership models and about voting rights and boardrooms and who's got voice, who's got priority. I mean, these are, I think, the big, big questions of 21st century economics as it relates to business. How do we design our businesses so that they yield different results than the ones that we're currently seeing as the huge problems of our planet? And of course, think profit distribution. Are dividends based on purely just the number of shares somebody owns? Which th This is a norm. At some point, we've accepted this, that if you have the biggest bank account, you get the biggest dividend check. So if that's the case, if that is the central pillar of uh, our corporate models that dominate our world, then that's more or less designed to drive and supercharge inequality. Then the most wealthy get the largest dividend check. They then reinvest that. They own even more shares then they get an even larger dividend check and wash and repeat, wash and repeat. And of course, when you look at this at a global picture, you see this huge increase in inequality, huge increase in returns uh, to those who have got the assets to invest. And uh, we've seen stagnation for, the, for others and we've seen uh, huge amounts of entrenched uh, and retained poverty and inequality overall. So this means that we really need to look at the distributional aspects um, in, in a very different way and no longer accept this reverse means test that has been baked into the way that value is distributed currently through our corporate models, which means that essentially the largest gains will go to those with the largest wealth to invest into the business. There's something inherently broken about that if we really care about inequality uh, as, as, as I think we all do. This is why inequality is a relative measure. It cannot simply focus on absolute measures of workers, for instance. So there's a lot of really interesting work going on that will look at individual instances of workers, community members, um, supply chain actors, and, and seeing how, do, how, can we, how can we improve their conditions. That's really, really important. I've spent a lot of my life trying to focus on those things. But if we want to be intellectually honest about inequality, we have to look at this as a relative measure. It must be about the proportions and the distributive aspects of how we are get how what proportion is going to those individuals versus others, and of course shareholders and owners are a part of that equation. So we need to talk money and we need to talk who gets what and in what proportions. This is why I see the Tifford concept note that I saw on the, on the website as particularly exciting, and I'm quoting here from from that individual document. Tiffid must also address the ways in which investors disproportionately benefit financially in relation to other stakeholders who take risk and create value, such as workers. Another part, transparent and consistent compensation data is required on the actual rates of return investors earn relative to other stakeholders, such as workers and communities who take on risk and contribute to the value creation process. So these are the bits about the direction of travel of Tiffid that excitement because nobody's been touching. This is so inconvenient to touch. We all want to look at the win-win. We all want to say, right, we'll make investors even richer by tackling inequality. And if there's anything you remember from some of the things that I think I've shared earlier in this, in this talk, perhaps we can see that's a little bit of an oxymoron. We need to potentially accept the fact that we need a different proportion of distribution of value and rewards in our economy. Um, and this is gonna mean a lot of uncomfortable conversations, it's going to require a lot of intellectual honesty, and I'm, I'm very confident that this work of Tiffid will put the data out there and the disclosure out there that will hopefully get us to a point where we start having very honest and open and goal-oriented discussions around inequality. So I'll end there, Joanne. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks so much, Erich, and um, and really appreciate that um, that that 
insight that you bring from from your perspective of having having really worked to try to re-engineer uh thinking about how we re-engineer companies and the economy and now seeing how how we can create the data uh and the transparency uh that is needed to to really begin the project of a of a sort of wholesale addressing of of inequality so so appreciate those comments um, next, I'd like to introduce, very pleased to introduce Professor Imran Velodia, who's an internationally recognized economist. Great to have the economist perspective and, and, uh, and uh, very heavy lift that the economist will be doing in this project. Um, Imran is the Dean of the Faculty of Commerce Law and Management at Witts University in Johannesburg. His research interests um, include inequality, competition policy, employment, the informal economy, gender and economic policy, and industrial um, development. He is the um, he leads the Southern Center for Inequality Studies, their partner in TIFTI, um, which is a multidisciplinary cross-country research and policy initiative to promote greater equality in the global South. Um, he's also a part-time member of the Competition Tribunal in South Africa, the commissioner of the National Wage uh, Commission. National Minimum Wage Commission, a member of the Academy of Science of South Africa, um, Standing Committee on Science for the Reduction of Poverty and Equality. Um, and he also has several distinguished political appointments, including uh, in, in August 2016, chairing the advisory panel on the national minimum wage, which led to the introduction of a national minimum wage in South Africa. Um, Imran, thank you so much for joining us. And um, we benefit so much from your uh, insights from um, specifically from the Global South and um, over to you. Great. Uh, the, the, thank you so much, Joanne. And, and, and thank you to you for uh, kind of reaching out to us and uh, kind of including us in the Tifty project, which we are um, kind of really, really excited about and, and kind of thrilled to be a part of. Um, so we, when we set up an, a, a kind of Center for Inequality uh, uh, Studies at our university, uh, part of our, our thinking for why we should have such a center was a, a kind of critique that the that though there was lots of, of kind of research, lots of policy, lots of, uh, of, of kind of thinking of, about inequality, uh, kind of actually levels of inequality across the globe were, 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 were going up and rising. And part of the, the kind of reason why we think that that, that is happening is because the, uh, the, the, the kind of field of inequality and the policies for addressing inequality have not sufficiently dealt with the realities of inequality in the global south where we think the the kind of problem is at its most kind of extreme and where the potential implications of this growth are quite quite um, are kind of really really concerning so i talk to you from a, a country where where we have something like uh, Forty-five percent of the workforce without uh, without a job, and in a country that has the highest Gini uh, 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 kind of across the whole world. So, in thinking about the 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 kind of Tifty issue, I, I wanted to share three thoughts about why. Uh, firstly, why why we think this framework applies as 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 uh, kind of especially to countries in the global south and then to to raise two kind of issues that we're thinking about that 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 uh, that, that 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 raise challenges for for this approach and i'm hoping that members of the audience would be keen to work with us on it so the first uh, point why why would this framework be especially important for uh, for uh, 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 countries such as uh, uh, such as south africa so in much of the global north you can partly fix the the kind of problems of inequality 
by the by the scale of the transfers that you would do through the kind of through the fiscal system. So in in most kind of European countries, you have a, a kind of tax to GDP ratio in the order of thirty to forty percent, and that that kind of allows countries in the global north to make massive transfers from from those who who, who benefit from economic output to those who are excluded countries in the in the global south have a lot less space to make those transfers and therefore in contexts like ours it is much more important for us to think about what are the outcomes from the production system it, uh, from the production system itself and what are the ways in which we can we 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 we, we can shift that production system to kind of generate equality outcomes that we would be a lot happier about so i think this 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 kind of framework is really important for for uh, uh, countries like south africa brazil and and um, 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 most of the global south and i think that's why we're kind of really really excited about it so to two problems uh, that that we're going to have to deal with so we're kind of in the process in south africa of amending some of our laws on uh, 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 kind of disclosure and there's a proposal to to um to kind of require companies to 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 kind of report on pay gaps so so we we will have data on on what are the pay pay gaps between the ceo and the uh, uh, lowest uh, 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 paid employee and some data on on kind of how kind of incomes are, 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 are kind of distributed inside the corporation now we, we think that that this is a, a kind of really exciting uh, uh, kind of area kind of, however when you live in a country where you have kind of half kind of half the, the uh, 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 population unemployed or if you're in india where say Kind of 85% of the workforce is in the informal economy. It seems to me measures of the sort only give you one, uh, uh, a not powerful uh, dimension of inequality. Um, and I think what what we're going to have to do in this initiative is think about ways in which we, we can have in 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 which we, we can have disclosure. Uh, 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 kind of requirements which would would place the corporation inside mm -hmm. its society and 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 force some types of disclosure that 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 kind of relate to the primary uh, kind of drive of inequality, which is really those who are excluded from the corporation. And I think we're going to have to think think through that. A last point that 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 seems really uh, Kind of important to me we cannot i don't think uh, deal with inequality in in countries without dealing with the issue of inequality across uh, uh, countries and you only have to think about the the kind of impact of the pandemic and the issue of access to 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 vaccines for that to be clear that that kind of global inequality is not is 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 kind of really the big uh, 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 picture issue here, and 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 kind of in can, uh, country inequality is really a subset of that larger problem. I think the the difficulty that we that we're going to have to deal with here is that many of these disclosure instruments can really apply in national jurisdictions um, and the, the 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 kind of challenge for 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 this group is that we're going to have to think about um, measures of disclosure that would 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 kind of link these these uh, uh, kind of global inequality issues 
uh, kind of inside the corporation with those inside the country. And I think that that's going to uh, uh, pose a few interesting, but, uh, but I think quite exciting challenges for us. With that, let me, let me pass it uh, uh, back to you, Joy. Thank you so much for those for those insights and really, really important insights um, for for all of us. Um, uh, I can't emphasize enough how how rarely we actually get to hear about that in these sort of larger discussions around um, inequality and disclosure frameworks and metrics and so forth. And this is why it is absolutely so essential that we depart from the way that governance that these that these disclosure frameworks have been created in the past and really create an inclusive uh, process so we can have the benefit of these kind of insights and, and know and, and, and be, I believe, on a much better path towards uh, achieving our goals. So we've sort of moved into uh, the kind of comments section of our of our panel. And um, the, and so first we'd like to hear from uh, Gisha Guillermo Correa, who is the executive director of um, the Argentinian Network for International Co Cooperation, ORASI, another member of the International Secretariat of TIFTI. Um, RASI is a civil society network based in Buenos Aires, and, um, and uh, uh, Guillermo himself has been working in civil society mm -hmm. for more than 15 years. He's a member of the executive committee of Civicus and of um, AGNA. He was uh, co-chair of the C20 uh, Civil Society Affinity Group during the Argentinian presidency of the G20. He's a political scientist with a master's degree in international relations, and he teaches in sev at several universities, both inside and outside of Argentina. Um, Gisha, pr pr let us know why are you involved in TIFTI and please provoke us. Looking forward to your comments. Thank you. First of all, I was in diapers when I started working on the NGO sector, John, because otherwise people will start doing math and they will figure out my my age. And I'm from Argentina. We like those things. So thank you, thank you very much, Adrian, for the intro and the rest of the panelists. It's, I'm, I'm privileged and I'm honored. And I'm still, I don't know why do you invite me to be part of TFT because I'm not a number person. I don't have a background in, in economy as Enrique and, and Imran was uh, explaining, or even Delilah. So uh, thanks God I'll be learning from you guys. But I think that our perspective is more about that. I, I'm a, I'm a doer, I'm a practitioner. And I've been working in the human rights field and good governance field for almost 20 years now. And, and the things we've tried and, you know, in, in NGOs, we work with peanuts, right? We get a small grant and we do, you know, activities and we try to kind of advocate or influence some uh, stakeholders. But at the very end, it's, you know, 12 months, 24 months. And so far, in regarding my own experience, we, we haven't succeeded in, in terms of trying to change systematically the system. We do work with several companies. Uh, one of the things we do is we, we try to kind of have I don't know, influence uh, corporations and companies through the corporate social responsibility programs in which we try to help them to do more wiser uh, investments. But so far, it's very kind of a localized, it's very punctual. Uh, sometimes companies do invest something in, in some, you know, poor communities. But we are not seeing, you know, that structural system change we are looking for. So when I realized about this initiative, I said, sure, I don't understand anything, but we have Delilah, about how financial markets works around the world. And that's not kind of a, my, my, I would say, my value added in this conversation. But I will bring, you know, the stakeholders and the grassroots uh, organizations into the conversations. I, I was saying the other day in an uh, internal coordination meeting, my stakeholders, uh, there are maybe two women, you know, feeding, you know, poor tiles 10 kilometers away from, from Buenos Aires. They don't even know how the, you know, financial markets will work in the U.S. or in, in the U.K. But for me is that if we can bring a new tool that is going to be a game changer for, for, for the way they live, that's my end into this um, initiative. So uh, my idea in, in, in this is trying to, to bring the global south perspective. I've already had a couple of questions for uh, Imran and Eric and, and Delilah because I'm going to be, you know, talking and speaking from the common ground. Uh, again, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a genius in terms of how financial markets work, but I will bring, you know, different multi-stakeholders and the grassroots organizations that are the ones, you know, 
trying to have this battle uh, in the field, right? Trying to, you know, feed those poor children or fighting different diseases or trying to bring more transparency into this world, either human rights or good governance issues. So let me say that I'm delighted to be here and I'm learning, I'm taking tons of notes and hopefully after our uh, amazing uh, speaker, Jillian, will do her uh, comments, I will bring you some interesting, hopefully some interesting questions to provoke uh, this conversation. Looking forward to it. And again, um, your role is no small role, Gisha, um, in this project, because if we, the only way that we can achieve what we hope to achieve is by bringing the voices of the very people that you just described into this process. And um, the Rossi's work in helping us to think about how we translate all that Delilah and the rest of us are talking about into something that people will take ownership of and understand the value of participating in is just such a crucial piece of this. So thank you so much for agreeing to take this on and, and for joining us with, with such enthusiasm. I now am very, very pleased to introduce um, Dr. Gillian, Gillian Marcel who leads the Resilience Capital Ventures, a boutique capital advisory pra pra practice specializing in blended finance. Um, Dr. Marcel developed the Triple B framework to improve flows of capital and its allocation um, to provide a, a platform for engaging um, in the finance and investment world, um, where she brings perspectives on diversity, inclusion, accountability, and alignment with the SDGs. Um, her experience includes staff roles with the International Finance Corporation, Equity Capital Markets at J.P. Morgan Chase, and mergers and acquisitions with British Telecom. Dr. Marcel currently serves as a non-executive director with the South African FinTech Tafari Capital, and she previously was an associate uh, tenured professor at Fitz Business School in Johannesburg, so a colleague of, of uh, Professor Velodias. She is also a published research scholar and maintains academic networks in the U.S. with um, um, at MIT and Penn State. Um, and uh, she, her international public service includes appointments with the United Nations and the World Economic Forum. We're so pleased to have you with us, Jillian. Over to you. Jillian, you're muted. Unmuted yourself. Jillian, can you hear us? Uh, I, think, Jillian. I think she's. I think she's muted too. Having bandwidth, some bandwidth issues, I think. Jillian, um, can you hear us? Maybe if we put it in the chat. Maybe she's with some that'll delay as well. So maybe that's why she can't hear. Yeah, it seems like it. Jillian, But she's still talking. That's interesting, right? She Jillian. may be asking where we uh, Jillian, can you hear us? She's now on, not on mute. You can hear us? Oh, I am so sorry. We're having having issues. Um I there we okay. I hope I I hope um, Ryan. I hope you can help us to to get Jillian back. Um, and uh, in the meantime, I'd like to. I see we're actually running a little bit short. Um, let me see where I'm having tr my own troubles with the system. So let me have a see where we are um, on the Q and A. Great. Um, I see that we do have some questions, but before them, Gisha, you promised to provoke. So let's go for it. Maybe I can start with uh, Enric. Uh, and, and I was thinking uh, during your uh, presentation, of course, inequality means different things in the global north and in the global south, for sure. And I was thinking, and also this is related to what Imran was saying, I, I'm, I'm living in a country, even though it's a G20 country, right? Argentina is one of the G20 countries, that at least 50% of our uh, labor force, it's uh, informal. 
So how do you think that uh, a framework like TIFTI could work in a scenario like Argentina? And I could say that, you know, uh, Latin America is the most unequal continent in the world. So for us, this is a huge thing. This is not just something that we, I mean, we deal with this daily basis. And to be honest, I mean, COVID came here only to make it even worse. So how do you think that, you know, taking into account the challenges we have in the global south with inequality and having around the 50% of our task force out of the system? How do you think like a framework like TIFTI could, could work? Well, uh, and I think we've got Gillian back too. So uh, let me know, Joanne, if you want me to, to, to pause and come back to that as a cliffhanger or <laughs> or should I plow ahead with, with the question? Oh, we do have Gillian back. Um, do you want to take on that quick question and then we'll go, sure. go over to, to Gillian? No, I, so, I, yeah. I think that there are a few aspects of, of this. Uh, one is the global value chain aspect and and i think earlier delilah also mentioned in her introduction that so much so many of the efforts of measuring inequality and aspects of inequality are missing the international supply chain angles you know there's a lot of very deep rooted attempts to understand what's happening with workers um rarely is it proportionally measured usually it's at a very absolute level you know in terms of are we getting to a living wage? Do we have certain conditions that, that are helpful potentially to, to drive down inequality? But the actual inequality question, even there, is, is it measured in the, in the way that I think it could be? Uh, but the international value chain bit is even worse, you know, particularly when you get below the first or second tier. And, uh, and any country, I think, that has a significant export market or, and is part of international value chains, uh, to really drive that inequality means we need to get beyond even stakeholder analysis, going beyond just going suppliers are stakeholders. Well, no, within the suppliers, there's suppliers of suppliers, there's the workers of suppliers, there's the communities of suppliers around them. So we need to sort of, I think, get, get far beyond that and start thinking about how value is distributed to different stakeholders within supply chains themselves. Uh, the other bit, I think, is around the informal economy, which, again, requires a much deeper dive into what's happening in, in all the different supply chains. A lot of you know, informal production is happening in the fashion sector, for instance, around the world. Home workers, you know, there, there are groups of artisans that, that are in different parts of the world that are organized in different ways. And there are ways of tracking where the money goes. You know? But I think it requires quite a bit of appetite to, to do some of that work, to understand how value distribution is working and understanding how... Uh, how then to deal with some of the uncomfortable things that will be uncovered when we start looking at sort of piecemeal rates and the way that, that workers, artisans, farmers are paid around the world, waste pickers are paid around the world who are in very informal relationships. And the last bit around that would be how do we organize those individuals in the informal economy into business organizations themselves so that they can be represented so cooperatives of waste pickers are emerging, for instance. One of the last things I did at the World Fair Trade Organization before I left was to support a group of waste pickers in India to, uh, who are collecting plastic for re to be recycled into global value chains to turn into not only a cooperative that then owns its own social enterprise, but one that is 100% aligned to the 10 principles of fair trade. They've now began exporting into uh, and, and selling into a whole bunch of global brands, including The Body Shop, who, who have hugely uh, supported that process, for instance. So I think we, we can also take quite a few initiatives that start looking at the business models that, that are giving greater voice, priority and value to uh, individuals in the informal economy, just as we do with formal sector workers. Gisha, I think you, you really poked poked Aaron's passion right there and <laughs> some of the work that he's been and working on for uh, in pioneering for so long. So so thank you for that and for your response, Aaron. Um, Jillian, do we have you? I hope so. Yeah. Yes, I think so. Yes. Can wonderful. you hear me? We can hear you and take it away. <laughs> Can't wait. Okay. All right. Thank you. So I'll, I'll skip the formalities. <laughs> And, and plunge right in. What I wanted to say is that I'm, I'm really delighted to be joining you in this conversation, mainly because it is a conversation that is taking place within the context of a group of people who have a tagline that says, from an op-ed to a manifesto to a movement. And I think that the remarks that I want to make and to bring to this group are that that kind of approach is completely absent in the financial world. 
so financial in investment worlds wouldn't know a movement if it if it sort of ran up and, and introduced themselves to it, right? And the reason that that is important is because it really then speaks to credibility. When you undertake an effort in order to step up a movement, it means that you're really thinking about the folks who will constitute that movement as the people that you're trying to convince. In the finance and investment world, when you write an article and it gets picked up by a responsible investor, which is no small feat, and then people uh, demonstrate um, interest, what you're usually trying to do is to make sure that the big boys, because it's boys, it's white men, middle-aged white men, who hold the power in the financial and investment space, do not feel so uncomfortable by what you are saying that they will engage. So it's two completely different motives and ways of promoting momentum. And why that matters is that to go back to the old school, Robert Chambers, who reality counts. So as Tifty grows up, who will you be wanting to be listening to you and believing you to be credible? The movement folks or the people in the boardrooms? And I spend a lot of time in advocacy on LinkedIn. And one of, one of the most interesting conversations that I had recently was with someone who just a few months ago was managing a three trillion dollar um so in delilah's um rubric this would be an asset owner and an asset manager because it was a, a large investment house and he and i were having a really good conversation about proximity mattering so that my continuous engagement with middle-aged white men who sit in zurich New York, London, telling them that they don't know what they're talking about in terms of ESG. And that is why there is this fantastic, not fantastic in a good way, but a misallocation problem is because the proximity that matters to the people who hold power in the finance and investment world is proximity to pools of capital. In the human rights world and in the development world, proximity to undignified lives that do not happen by accident those undignified lives did not simply happen those undignified lives are a result of late stage capitalism and so when we talk about proximity and we talk about inclusion i'm not usually postmodernist but we actually have to talk about the narrative when we are having this conversation and we say, let's move on from the isms. That doesn't mean that the material conditions and the historical conditions that led to late stage capitalism have gone away. We can, we can sort of talk about being optimism. I do it all the time with my WEF colleagues. We're resetting all sorts of things. The structural conditions have not changed. And so, my origin as a Caribbean woman means that my intellectual foundation, Samir Amin, Andre Gunder Frank, Eric Williams, Walter Rodney, means that the structural conditions that have led to inequality cannot be outside of this conversation. It is impossible for those structural conditions the causes, the fundamental causes that give rise to contemporary inequality, which leads to the 1% owning twice as much economic wealth as 6.9 billion people. If TIFD does not have an answer for that, if TIFD is not getting excited or worried about that, then you will have a credibility problem. It doesn't mean that you can't embrace it, but you have to tackle it. It has to kind of give you a feeling in the pit of your stomach because otherwise you will start the conversation as Delilah did 
very technically very sound about looking at the causes of inequality from the point of view of financial investors and then rewarding companies who do a good job of reducing inequalities. Those are technically very, very sound, but they are devoid of the context in which 6.9 billion people have lives that are not the kinds of lives that we would want them to have. And so the credibility of TIFTI and any other disclosure uh, mechanism, disclosure coalition would have to be grappling with some of those fundamentals. And I think that there are, there are ways to do that and to do it well, but I think it means going back to some of the fundamentals from an intellectual point of view, from a why are we doing what we're doing point of view so that we can grapple with some of those really big questions. So thank you for, thank you for having me and allowing me to um, put forward those kinds of ideas. Jillian, thank you for those very provoking um, and important ideas. And um, I, I want to give the panelists a chance to, to react and respond to this. Um, I also note that there is a question in the Q&A. Um, and actually, it's I, hello, Anna. It's from Anna. Um, Nikolova, a former student. So I'm really delighted to see you here. Um, and I, I understand that there's, um, Anna is asking, how do you see investors responding to the concept that increasing returns, and sorry, I've just got a notification that I can't go away. Hold on. Uh, that increasing returns is not a desirable goal especially since ESG is currently marketed as a way for growing wealth. So it very much speaks to, to what um, Jillian has just said. How is it actually going to work? And um, I'd love to, who would like to volunteer? And maybe I, either, um, Gisha says, absolutely not. Delilah or Imran, would you like to respond? Yeah, I, I wasn't, I can respond, um, or Imran, if you want to respond. I think, I wasn't sure if the question was directed to, to Erinch, too, so. Okay, Erinch, we'll, I, we'll, I we'll, thoughts, put you but... on the, we'll put you on the spot as well. D D Delilah, you go first. I'll, I'll build on that, on what you've got to say. Okay. Um, so I think that there are, as I mentioned, there are different kinds of investors out there, and um, there are investors who, invest for very long-term returns and there are investors who invest for you know the short-term gains and um and i think in the early stages of tifty we believe there's an opportunity to build momentum with those investors who are long-term investors and they recognize that they their returns cannot be sustainable if they're constantly extracting to maximize the near-term return so they have to reduce some of the extraction in the near term um potentially and the pre-distribution initiative my organization is sort of working through um different models of generating returns that aren't as extractive that could allow investors to maintain um uh, sufficient return to cover what they need so for instance pensioners you know they might invest a pension fund might invest in private equity targeting a 20 percent internal rate of return, as they call it. Um, but uh, really, uh, the pension fund, in order to pay pensioners and cover its liabilities, only needs a roughly 7% rate of return. And so they invest in all different kinds of um, investments with different, uh, what they call risk-adjusted returns. Some are very safe investments, like, um, investment grade bonds with low rates of return and low risk. And some of their some of them are very high risk investments with high rates of return. And they blend all those investments together and they say, that's how we're gonna get our 7% rate of return. At the pre-distribution initiative, we're saying there might be, um, well actually, and I should say that the super high risk, high return investments are generally the ones that tend to be very extractive. So the pre-distribution initiative, we're saying, don't overcompensate for the super low end returns, the safe investments with very high risk investments. Maybe there's a way to invest more in the middle 
of the risk return spectrum. So you're not extracting so much and you can make a sufficient return, not, not a super high extraordinary return, but a sufficient return in order to pay your pensioners um, pensions. Um, that's an example with a pension fund. Now, clearly that argument won't work with all different kinds of investors. There are some high net worth individuals um, or wealthy people who will just want to make as high returns as possible. And it might be harder to bring them along. But if we can bring the really big investors along in the very beginning um, in this journey um, and, and uh, with these kinds of arguments and build momentum, then it will be very difficult for the other investors, the stragglers, the you know individual investors, to say we you know we don't want to go along with this regime, especially if um, the big investors get uh, these kinds of disclosures officially mandated by governments and um, policymakers and regulators, and and that becomes the new norm for the market. So it requires a cultural shift and and um, bringing certain folks along earlier than others, uh, and that's some some preliminary thoughts on that yeah i mean i could, I could build on that a little bit because I, I think it's it's a really important question and and i think it, it sort of gets to the heart of maybe the big economic challenge for several centuries now around tragedy of the commons that we all know that inequality has to be tackled it's terrible for our societies it's terrible for for for, for our health it's terrible for security and for stability it's, it's terrible for crime it's terrible for educational outcomes nobody wants to live in highly unequal societies where you have to wall yourself off and you know disconnect yourself from the rest of your communities in order just to feel safe this is an undesirable outcome that we all have so at a systemic level we all know we don't want to we don't want this but uh, and at an individual level, it's like everybody's waiting for somebody else to move. Nobody wants to be the one that takes the hit on their returns in order to contribute to having the kind of economic equality that will foster a far better uh, living standard for all of us who, who have to live in these societies around the world. So I think there is this distinction between the economic case and the business case and, uh, and, and who actually carries this to help us create the commons. There's, I think what Delilah said around sufficiency versus maximization is also a really critical point. You know, we've built everything to maximize, maximize, max, maximize the profit, maximize the return, measure quarterly, everything, bang, bang, bang. But what is sufficient? What is enough? And can we get to a point where it, it, sufficient returns are the objective? And we sometimes say, you know what, increase the worker wages because I, I've made the fair return on this. But at the moment, that is not how financial systems all corporate models are structured to behave. They're structured to always want more. Nothing is ever enough. You want more than what you got yet last year. You want to grow your, your business. You want to grow your pie. You want to grow your market. You want to grow your returns. And that sort of obsessive, compulsive, you know, forever straight jacketed into grow, grow, grow kind of structure is, I think, at the heart of all of this. Um, so yeah, I think I think there is a way of restructuring a lot of this, but it means we need to go beyond, you know lying to ourselves and saying you know what you'll make even more money next year if you were to address this you might not you'll probably make a sufficient amount and that should be fine but if we want to tackle inequality it is a proportional question it's it's about the proportions of how things are shared and uh, on a planet of finite natural resources where our economic activity has got a huge ecological footprint then the way we distribute the benefits of that ecological footprint has to be much more equal there's just no other way otherwise we'll destroy ourselves and we'll be reminded of that cartoon that I'm sure many of you have seen where you're sitting in a post-apocalyptic world and, and they're sitting around a campfire and saying, yes, we did destroy the world, but for a beautiful moment in time, we maximize returns to shareholders. Yeah. And uh, that's where we're headed. Um, it's, it's, uh, we're, we're driving off a cliff of inequality unless we decide to move together. Jillian, I was just about to say, I'm looking at you the whole time that, that, that Delilah and Erin are talking and I'm thinking about what you said as Tifty grows up, where do we, you know, the, where do we want to have legitimacy? Which of, which of these two camps, which as you define it, are so incredibly different? Um, how do we really bring that forward? That is a, you know, provocative challenge, and I'm sure you have something to say about that. So, over to you. Well, I want I I want to go in a in a, a slightly different direction and ask. Enrich and Delilah to also just reflect on what they've just said for the last like five minutes, because 
those things are not true of the entire world. And yet, and Rich, you use the word we, you, you were passionately invoking and calling upon people to sort of stop with the greed and so on. And so my reminder is, in terms of cognitive justice, what you have just described is only true of societies that were based on Anglo-Western values. And so part of the cognitive justice is to stop that. It is to recognize that there are cosmologies, have been cosmologies that have survived genocide that were never about profit maximization at all costs. Because if you want to be inclusive, and yet your agenda is about helping people to recover, what you're doing is again trampling by not recognizing that there is something to be learned from societies, whether it's indigenous societies, native societies, ancient civilizations, who were much better at stewarding the planet, who were much better and are much better at intergenerational uh, equity than European Anglo-Western societies. So part of engaging with inequality is the acknowledgement of past harm, because unless you acknowledge that it is a particular cosmology that led to this situation that we're in as a human family, we will not actually be able to go forward in an inclusive way. So I wanted to make sure that I made that point, that my nodding was not agreeing that we're all about greed, because we're not. Thank you so much, Jillian. I, um... I was just about to, I'm new to this uh, platform, obviously, so as we all are, but I was just about to invite, um, I understand that we can bring some of our colleagues um, onto the platform or anyone who would like to. And I saw our colleague, Paul Rissman, my co-founder at Rights Collab in the waiting room. And I was just about to invite you in, Paul, to, to uh, assuming that you wanted to ask a question. So if you want to head back into whatever mode you got to so that I could hit the plus sign and join you in, please feel, please feel free to do so. Um, Imran, would you like to, to comment on, on any of that? Yeah, I, th I, th I think just two, two thoughts. And I think they both sort of revolve around how we think about the investment process in, in kind of relationship to time. So, I th I think as Jillian's pointed out, I th I th I think we can't wipe out of this the kind of question about how we think about where we are today and how we look back, and I think those kind of processes of of looking backwards to 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 kind of how we 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 sort of got to the inequality patterns that we have both within countries but more so kind of inequality across the globe i think our key is is the one key dimension of that time horizon the kind of second is is one that is looking forward and i think the the two thoughts i would have there is that i th i think we can all agree that that kind of investment strategies that are more long term focused and less short term for focused would be would, would would be better for everyone the 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 kind of challenge is to is to is to is to is to get the system to think more long term and for those who push a, a kind of exclusively short term view to have some penalties within that system and and perhaps the disclosure kind of helps us along mm -hmm along that path but i think the more important time kind of horizon question just thinking back to Erin's point is the the it, it it kind of seems to me that if we if we if we we kind of really concerned about the collective interest of everyone which i think we kind of have to be and i think the maximization 
model has to be adapted to be thinking a lot more about sustainability because if we don't address that issue um i th i th i think not only will the world become a lot more kind of unequal but i think the costs of that maximization model will will will, will be pretty serious and and my sense is the cost of that is also going to be 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 kind of distributed in a kind of in an extremely unequal way pretty much along the the, the kind of patterns that we have uh, that we have today so i think the the kind of framework has to kind of has to be thinking about time both back backward and forward and that that, that building that into the conceptualization of the tools, I, th I think would be quite critical. Super helpful, thank you. Um, we had a question um, that I, I think Delilah touched on. I'm not, I wanna make sure that um, people felt that uh, if they had anything more to add on it, um, that built on Anna's question about that, how do future pensioners in the global north fit into the discussion about redistribution of value? And Delilah, you did speak to sort of sufficient sufficiency as a as a, uh, a, me, a means by which the pensioners would still uh, be able to get the the returns that they expect. Um, is it were there any other comments there? Any any addition? I've, I've, I've got a few. I mean, just one quick point about that, which is that um, pensioners who are workers predominantly made their money and their income through their labour and improving wages, improving conditions of work is probably the most important way to improve the conditions that pensioners uh, will live in. So um, I think the other thing is that pension funds are still subscribed to this model where they are returning based on the wealth of the individuals. So the richest pensioner who had the highest income and the largest amount to invest gets the biggest dividend check or the biggest return. And the, the one who's got the least wealth and the poorest pensioner as part of that pension fund gets the small. So th that is still perpetuated through that system. Um, it, something goes to, the, to everybody. That's, that's absolutely true. But in a world where we're looking at the distribution of value, uh, we also need to recognize that while pensioners are part of that system and do get some of the value when we maximize the total returns to investors, that they it's still perpetuating inequality within pensioners and between pensioners and other investors out there. So that question doesn't quite go away. Um, but I think that ultimately, if we improve working conditions and we improve the way that, that people are paid, um, people don't need to necessarily depend upon the pension fund then working to make huge amounts of return for them after retirement either. Great. Yes. Great. Was that a thumbs up, Delilah, or a, that was a thumbs up? Do, uh, do you mind? Yes. Do you mind? I, I do want to go back to what uh, Eric was saying before about always wanting more. I think that we are talking about human nature, right? And that's why uh, we always want more. The Romans, many, many centuries ago, created the law. So and, and let me jump into what Delilah was saying at the very beginning. So Delilah, bear with me on this. Let's travel together five kilometers away from Buenos Aires to those two women feeding children, okay? Nearby uh, my city here. How we will translate what Tiffet is into their own reality, maybe through other examples. Have other frameworks worked in different maybe areas in which you can say, okay, this have worked, so now we are translated this into the final system, and we believe that we will, this will succeed. Please join me in this journey together. And let me add on to that, because in the interest of time, because we're just at the end, and I'm so glad these questions are coming at the end. It's what someone, um, a participant has asked, how does TIFTI intersect with the goal of infusing workplace with democratic principles? Um, some examples would be useful. So bringing those two ideas together about how do we really create, um, think about participatory, bringing democratic governance to this entire enterprise. Delilah, you got pinged, so. <laughs> okay, big, big questions to answer in five minutes um, and hopefully have more discussion after. I Less than that because um, I want to ask Gillian something too, so go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll be. I'll, I'll try to keep it brief. I think that. Um, I think that um, Gisha, the question that you raised and the question that was raised in the chat um, about uh, democratic governance are really important ones, and um, I think a lot of it goes back to what uh, 
Jillian said in terms of what can we learn from other cultures and um, and um, other ways of organizing ourselves that have existed, that do exist. Um, so I'm excited about this being a multi-stakeholder co-creation process because I'm interested in learning more about um, what already, already exists. I know um, Erin mentioned uh, Marjorie Kelly, who's done a lot of work on uh, sort of um, democratically run companies, which we can learn from as well. Um, uh, indigenous cultures. Uh, and I think also in terms of how to um, translate this into something for uh, people who aren't familiar with finance, I think that we hope Tifty will, um, will create a forum where uh, we can learn how to use our own technical jargon and, and ways of understanding the world and talk to um, other people who uh, have different ways of interpreting uh, the world and we can we can learn from each other um, and and help build a better solution that way. And so I know we're not going to reach everybody in the world in this engagement process. Uh, you know, not every mother feeding um, children in every corner of the world, but hopefully the organizations that uh, or, or entities that she might engage with or represent her. Um, because I, I think that's part of the problem is um, to to use the Marxist term alienation. Investors are are very alienated from the people that that are their are stakeholders in their whole value creation process on the ground, or people who aren't even part of it. Um, to to speak to Imran's point about um, about the informal economy, and also your point, Keisha. So I'll stop there because we only have two minutes. I could go on, but hopefully that's enough. Jen, do you mind if I tap on Gillian's comment? Gillian, at some point, yes, yeah, so, sorry, fast. Uh, at some point, you define inequality as something that is produced and reproduced by white men in boardrooms in London, uh, New York, and uh, Geneva, to say so. How do we bring then more diversity into those decision making spaces? How do we do that? So, um... Let me let me let me tackle. I wanted to make a comment to Delilah, and I'll I'll answer um, uh, Gisha's question at the same time. So, the the reason that I work on transactional finance is because it's not because I have anything personally against the folks who are doing it at the moment, except that they're doing a really bad job. And I know that they're doing a really bad job because when I worked for J.P. Morgan initiating coverage for the, the first listed company in all of sub-Saharan Africa. I used to have to engage with these guys and help them to spend, to invest in projects that would yield them 25% in a, an IRR of 25% in US dollar terms. And so one of the things that we have to understand is the financial process is very subjective. And so the blind spots around race, around gender, around geographic origin are embedded in the kind of investment decisions that those folks make. So the reason that we have a hundred trillion dollar gap for SDG finances, because the people who are sitting in Zurich, in London, in New York, in Paris, are doing a bad job at evaluating risk. They cannot differentiate between perceived risk and real risk. And so it is that proximity. They are proximate to pools of capital. And, and my friend who I was talking about said, you know, you know, stop giving us a hard time because we are more likely to persuade big pools of capital to shift because we're proximate to them. And he's absolutely right. Delilah was able to get into responsible investor. And then she got a response because of proximity, because of relationship capital. But your lady with the four children is completely in a different social context. And the people who have the capital 
do not know how to deploy that capital in a way that benefits your um, your constituency. So we are actually this effort, whether it's a disclosure forum or any other effort, we're actually doing the work to make capital work better because we have to. If they knew what they were doing, we would not have this situation that we have currently. We have to help them. <laughs> so, so that's my answer, that we have to help them. And, and it's not about representation. It's about expertise. It's about insight. And so that's why the diversity of those pools of capital and the, the diversity in terms of diversity of knowledge diversity of insight in terms of who do we have making decisions about investment today. It must change because if it doesn't, we will be having this conversation for another generation. Jillian, thank you so much. And Gisha, thank you for, for provoking or prompting Jillian to make those remarks. Um, and Jillian, I can assure you that it, at a very, it is our intention to maintain human rights as the North Star in this project to develop TIFTI. And again, we are very grateful to the Global Forum on Democratizing Work for giving us this space to discuss uh, TIFTI and um, hope that those of you who are still with us will, uh, will participate. Um, know again that we cannot do this alone. Uh, we are looking for widespread participation from all voices, diverse participation, um, and uh, you can learn more about us on our growing website, <laughs> which we um, new newly newly launched website or newly uh, uh, initial website. But uh, we will have increasing information there at thetifty.org. Thank you all for being with us. Thank you so much, Delilah, Imran, Erinj. Isha and Jillian for joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye.